Hi, good morning everyone or good afternoon to some of you. Uh, my name is Tyler Mitchell and I am the president of Snowfly and I want to thank you all for uh, taking the time to uh, be with us today and attend this webinar event which we hope you will find uh, beneficial and informative. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started and I'm going uh, to introduce Dr. Brooks Mitchell and uh, for those of you that don't know that in summary this guy knows his stuff when it comes to employee retention and employee incentives. Uh, he was the uh, star of a company uh, called Aspen Tree Software, which was the originator of the web-based or computerized employment interview process, and really a pioneer in that area. Um, in 1998, he did start this company, Snowfly Performance Incentives. He founded it. Um, and for those of you that don't know, this is a company that uh, we do a web-based incentive management system that can focus on retention, like Brooks is going to speak about today, or other performance areas. He's written two books, one of which was a bet on cowboys, not horses, which is a very insightful and witty glimpse uh, into the area of employee selection. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Mitchell. Well, thank you, uh, Tyler. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Brooks Mitchell here from Fort Collins, Colorado. Employee turnover, is, uh, especially at the non-exempt areas in many organizations, is now rearing its head once again. It just seems like it goes in cycles. Uh, I did my doctoral dissertation on reducing employee turnover uh, in non-exempt jobs uh, several years ago and have since then done hundreds of studies on people, keeping people on the job. And I'm going to give you some new ideas today. Uh, based, everything we do is based on research uh, that into the behavioral sciences, some statistics, and also this whole new emerging area of game theory, gamification, and the Gen X people and their ubiquitous cell phones. There's a relationship here. Um, and if you'll just hang with me here for about 15 or 20, 30 minutes, whatever, I'm going to give you three things that you can do tomorrow that will reduce employee turnover. So there's a uh, a little payback here. Uh, these are not like a long-range strategy, which is okay, and those things help. But there's three things that if you'll do tomorrow that are easy to do, and it will reduce your employee turnover rate. Now, four major components to improving turnover. Number one is measurement. Most people, I've asked hundreds of people this question in my visits around the United States over the years, and I say, what's your turnover rate? I don't think I've had a single company or person respond to anything other than to give me an annual statistic. It's 150 percent, 75 percent, 300 percent or whatever per year. That's not the right way to measure employee turnover. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. There's other measurements which keeps people more accountable. Secondly, understanding the key factors about why people stay, not why they leave. Most organizations, when they approach turnover and try to come up with strategies, say, well, why are people leaving us? Well, that's the wrong way. I would rather you look at why are people staying with you. No matter how bad your organization is, your pay, your working conditions, supervisors, training, or whatever, you still have people who stay with you, and we need to understand that. And I'm going to give you a clue uh, increasingly these days is why people do stay with you. Uh, if you look at why people leave, you then you assume there's something wrong with you. If you look at why people stay with you, then perhaps there are some secrets there that we can look for and look for biographical factors. People, Biographical factors, biodata is what we call it. That's what I did my dissertation on years ago. It's looking at facts about people, not personalities or whatever, a fact. Are they employed? What's their educational level? There are clues there. And then, of course, how to measure and track things as they go along so that you can see which direction you're heading in. Okay, now this is what I call the employee turnover phenomenon. And I don't care what, with, if the job is an electrical engineer or a uh, operator, a call center operator, this phenomenon is what goes on. And what happens is, and this particular graph here is for uh, call center type jobs, but it could be technician jobs or whatever, 
is that the vast majority of turnover occurs in the first, second, and third month of employment. And then you will see that if you can, after the third month, and it might be, you know, it might be one month, it might be 90 days, you'd have to take a look at it statistically, but you can get that data off your employment and termination records. You'll see after that it begins to flatten out. So if you can make improvements, for example, in that kind of purple lavender area, in the first month, you could just reduce it there and measure it there and control it there, you will see then that you get continuing compounding effects throughout the year so that your annual rate would go down, but the way you want to measure it and reward it and hold people accountable. If you, the accountability is always a big issue. People respect what the boss can inspect, not what she expects. And many times, you know, if you say, well, what's your, your, your turnover rate is 125% per year. And if you go to someone, a manager or supervisor, and say 125%, we've got to get that down to 75%. Okay, boss, we'll, we'll do that. Well, the accountability factor has moved out almost like a year. But if you say, what's your 30-day rate, what's your 60-day rate, you can hold people accountable to that. If you make those early improvements, you will begin to make the annual rate. Now, back when I was first a uh, young practicing behavioral scientist at Texas Instruments, working uh, in, with a colleague, Scott Myers, who is now deceased, but probably one of the greatest practicing industrial psychologists to ever have lived. I was extremely fortunate in my career to get to know Scott, to work with him. And he did a study, which I was just a data collection clerk for, that was published in a Harvard Business Review called Breakthrough and On-the-Job Training. And I encourage anyone out there to get this. And we had tremendously high turnover rates in those days, back in the 60s. We were hiring thousands of people a day. They were coming from all over Oklahoma and Texas to Dallas and Sherman, Texas, and McKinney, Texas to do uh, very routine manual jobs for $1.60 an hour. Scott discovered some things there. And number one, the very first days for any new employee are very anxious. So what he did was, the first thing was not to get people to understand you will succeed at this job here. You're going to have some very tough situations to, to begin to build their expectations. And your supervisor is not a bad person. Get to know him or her and take the initiative to meet others. Now, that was genius, to meet others. Get to know, make friends there. And, and when you make friends with your coworkers, what happens is, well, you begin that bonding process. And that bonding process is what keeps people on the jobs. And it's been magnified many times over these days by social media and things, this tremendous desire that people have to bond. So we, we set up programs there to, number one, just let people know you're going to succeed here. This job looks very difficult. These machines look intimidating. And your supervisor, who's busy, is not a bad person. Uh, and you should try to get to know them. And all of these things will help. And we had a tremendous uh, reduction in employee turnover and absenteeism on those things right there, but dealing with the early, early deals of behavior. Now, another piece of research, the morale curve, developed at the Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, one of the world's foremost psychological psychiatric clinics. And they were engaged back in the 60s uh, to work with the Peace Corps to stop uh, high attrition rates there. I actually joined the Peace Corps. I came to my senses uh, and didn't do it. I, it just wasn't for me. But I had a lot of friends who did go to the Peace Corps, and they'd get all excited about it, and they'd go to these faraway places around the globe, and then they would, the first six months, three months, would just quit and come back. Well, so the Miniger Clinic got involved uh, with that, and they discovered this concept, or defined it, called the morale curve. What they found was that on any new job, or in this case, going to the Peace Corps, your morale is high, you're excited, something new, or whatever. And then very quickly upon arrival at this new job, you hit that, well, we see that line there that says normal job morale, you begin to quickly 
get depressed or just it's not what you thought it would be. And that corresponds very to uh, very much to this process right here. Those first days are absolutely critical. If you can just get them past three months or whatever, over here, 60 to 90 days, this is where you attack turnover. And basically, the morale curve that they discovered for the Peace Corps is that quickly you go into the blues. And that's when people would bail and say, I can't take it here anymore. I can't eat rice every meal or whatever like that. But then, if they got past that 90 days, their morale began to increase and get up to an acceptance level and actually get above the normal job morale, and they would hang in there. So what did the Peace Corps do? What they did was they just told people, they explained this to them, that this morale curve concept is a natural cycle rhythm of life, and that if you'll just hang in there, I promise you, you're going to feel better. So when Mary or Billy would walk in and say, I, I, I need to leave and go back to the States, they would say, look, if you just stay another 30 or 60 days, then we'll give you a first-class ticket back or whatever. But just stay here and, and nothing else. Just stay here. You're going to feel better. And this would give people assurance. And suddenly the Peace Corps, which is almost in failure because of this, quickly reversed things and uh, became a great success. Well, the same thing is with the job. Look, guys, I mean, your old job, you're all excited or whatever here, uh, but just understand that you're probably going to be depressed about it. It's not going to be the same. It's going to be frustrating. If you'll just hang in here for 90 days, if we can get them there, then our chances are going to keep them. Now, let's move to this other ubiquitous phenomenon that's going on. I, I, this one uh, caught me by surprise. I still don't understand it, but gamers. Uh, I watch my grandsons, I mean, it's just amazing, at six and seven, eight years old, playing games, they're they are hooked by these. And so there's been some great research on who are these gamers, and they spend more money, there's more money spent on games these days than on movies. The research is that gamers, people who play games, are more likely to care about their company. Uh, they prefer pay for performance versus salary. You get a real gamer in there, they will respond to incentive systems. They prefer to, they want to be monitored. They're used to it by playing games or progress. Uh, this is a way that they can connect with their co-workers. And gamers, believe it or not, have higher job satisfaction than non-gamers. So now we talked earlier about biographical factors. If I were looking for employees to staff up a lot of high turnover jobs, someone who was a gamer uh, would certainly be someone that would be uh, evidence of this biofactor that would that I would be interested in hiring. Now, from my field, the field of behavior psychology, if you want early successes on the job, create high morale, little successes. Um, for example, what you should begin doing with people from the day one in training is to identify very identify very small, specific, easily achievable behaviors and reward those behaviors uh, and reward as closely you can as you can to the actual behavior, which is what Snowfly does is via the internet, when somebody makes a, uh, an achievement, creates a, meets a goal or something, it could be as simple as just coming to work uh, or whatever, but performance goals, then they get an immediate reward for that uh, instantly as opposed to you know, at the end of the month on your paycheck or whatever. And then there's the power of random intermediate reinforcement, the most powerful reinforcement known to mankind. And that is random intermittent reinforcement uh, is the type of reinforcement that occurs, but it occurs at different levels. You just don't know when it is. So it might be if you do something, you meet a goal, you might get one, you might get five, you might get ten or whatever, uh, but you don't know what it is. It's a random number. And that is a much more powerful change, uh, uh, behavior change reinforcement than just simply getting something every time. So as opposed to getting 10 points or getting a dollar if you do something, uh, the ability, and this is what Snowfly does, is to give people the ability to play a quick five-second game that might yield you know, a dime, it might yield 50 cents, it might yield $50 uh, or whatever, but it's immediate 
intimately tied to that behavior. And when you do that with new employees for little behaviors, you begin to increase early success rates and the likelihood they'll create that 90 days. That's what we call behavior shaping. Take big behaviors and break them into small components. That's what we did at Texas Instruments with these highly you know, sophisticated semiconductor machines. Look, guys, first of all, let's just start with turning the switch on. Everybody see how you turn this on? And then you could begin to reward that. Some of you uh, in, listening in our audience today might remember the old, uh, what we call program learning uh, systems years ago. They were beautiful. They're wonderful. They're still very much appropriate today. Where you just learn one little thing, you answer a question, and then you build on that. It's kind of like building a pyramid. Just build that base there. And then you can reinforce those, and those little successes lead to changes. Down at the bottom, you'll see reinforce the daily homework, not the final grade. I, my parents used to try and bribe me. We'll give you $10 for an A and $5 for a B and $2 for a C. And anything less than that will kick you out of the house or something. Well, that's okay. That's a specific behavior. But more, you get better results by saying, if you do your homework today, or in my case, even bring your homework home, there might be a reward for that. But if you do the, the daily homework, you get reinforced in little pieces for that, then you'll do better on the test on Friday and the, the monthly grade and, and the final grade, but by reinforcing those little things there. So what are some new employee behaviors that you could reinforce with incentives? Well, number one, just little easy daily training goals. Number two is daily attendance. Attendance is quickly, is a very, very early, well, it's an early sign of turnover. If someone starts missing the job, uh, whatever, then they're more likely to terminate in that first 90 days. So I'm a believer in a daily attendance award, uh, early performance successes, frequent t tenure achievement. You get a reward uh, for your one week, a, a badge, a star or something. Now, the, one of the big ones here, co-worker acquaintance goals, and I'm going to talk more about that in a minute, supervisor acquaintance goals, and then the ability for new employees to empower them with some type of reward system that they can use to reward people for helping them. What we know with new employees who go through training, they are sometimes afraid, afraid of, intimidated by their supervisor. They need help, and they think, well, they, they told me how to do this. I'm going to look stupid if I ask. But if you give them a way to reward their co-workers for helping them without going to the supervisor, you can increase the chances of uh, making that 90-day deal. There's some sourcing things. Your website, you know, if people visit your website uh, and they come through that, you can reward that. Uh, you can have open houses and you can reward attendance and you can reward your employees for bringing people there, which is going to get me to the three things you can do tomorrow in just a minute. Uh, completing your application online, making an appointment, keeping the appointments, all of these things that you can begin to reinforce in your prospective employees even before they go to work. Uh, now, some co-worker things, employee referrals. Uh, to my listening audience, I bet I have done two or three hundred uh, biographical surveys where I take successful people on your jobs and compare them with unsuccessful people and look for those biographical clues, there is one that almost always shows up. And that is people who are referred by an existing employee will have significantly better tenure rates than people who do not. Uh, you can do inter acquaintance goals, people who introduce themselves, bonding goals, any, even things as simple as a Friday coffee or cinnamon roll or whatever, things like that, meeting early tenure goals. But any behavior which ties the employee to the group increases that social bond and carpooling is another one and of course peer-to-peer -peer, uh, way that is. Ways for peers to be able to reward, to reinforce each other without having to go through the supervisor. Snowfly, we have a peer-to-peer -peer program where employees are given little game tokens, electronic game tokens, that they can actually give to someone else. Uh, and I just, the next slide here, um, show you just a few things that people, these are very almost touching in some ways. 
I want to thank Tracy for taking care of my desk while I was out for my dad's funeral. She is always there for me when I'm out, even on my flex days. Thank you, Tracy. And whoever sent that to Tracy was able to send them some reward game tokens in this case, but an actual reward for doing that. Uh, another one, thank you for working my mail on whatever day. When I had to leave to get my sick son from school, I really appreciate it. Thank you for staying late and helping with me with my mail. Thank you for taking time to help me with a messy claim. I appreciate your willingness to take the extra time to walk through and re-explain. These are things that peer-to-peer -peer increase that bond between people. And that then leads me to the last slide here. And the three things that you can do tomorrow now as a result of this webinar uh, is, number one, you can change your measurement. Go back and get your uh, payroll records or whatever you need to and find out what your 30-day rate is, your 60-day rate, your 90-day rate, and begin to measure and reinforce those. Number two, if you institute a referral program tomorrow and tie that to a significant incentive with your existing employees to get people in, and they have, I have a, they have an incentive reason to do this, and I, it should be uh, uh, substantial enough to interest them, then you will reduce employee turnover. Those people that are referred by existing people because of a social bond always here. People stay on your jobs because of social bonds. They don't leave for more money. They don't leave for working conditions and all these other things, which is what you might think, assuming there's something wrong with you. They stay because they have a bond. You could maybe get them to carpool. I would, if I had a large call center, I'd have a separate area right next to the front door that if people carpool, they could park there. Because why? Well, because if you're carpooling, you're bonding with someone. You're building that, that, that glue there that keeps people together, that keeps people on the job. Someone's thinking about leaving because they're frustrated. They think, well, you know, I could take another job, but, you know, I just need to stay here. I've got, I like Mary, I like Billy, or whatever like this. And then number three, some type of way peer-to-peer -peer incentives that you can give to your employees that they can give to their coworkers on a peer-to-peer -peer basis for helping them out or doing things of this type. Those things, those three things right there, there are obviously other things you can do too, but those three things right there will create a very strong bond. People stay because of social relationships. If you don't remember anything at this webinar besides that, remember, people stay because of social relationships. Anything you can do to reinforce, to buttress up those social relationships will reduce turnover for you, and it won't take long.